Can any living creature exist without making noise? As a parent, I say no. Up next, Valerie Godinez of the Mistros Group joins us for a look at the physics of sound and the film A Quiet Place. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and today we're talking about sound with Valerie Godinez, VP of Engineering and Product Development at the Mistras Group. Hello, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. In The Quiet Place, John Krasinski, Emily Blunt, and their fictional children are hiding from creatures that hunt by sound, and so they must live their lives in silence. Okay, Valerie, as a parent of two little kids, I cannot imagine this ever happening. But as a scientist, is, is, absolute, science, is absolute silence ever even possible for any living creature? Well, this is an interesting question. I don't think so. I don't think so because every time there is movement at any scale, there is sound. We might not be able to hear that sound because of the characteristics of the sound. But the sound is there, it's being produced. Well, when we were reviewing questions for this episode, we were trying to think, we weren't really sure how to describe a, a minuscule sound. You know, we were trying to think of the auditory equivalent of microscopic. What, what word were we looking for? What is it? You can go as deep as you want into that. It, it's, oh, I want uh, to go deep, Valerie. OK, let's, uh, let's think about um, cell level microscope, you know, we have uh, bacteria, for example, and when bacteria reproduce, they make they sound. Make sound. They make sound. And you can measure that sound. In fact, it has been done. You know, a uh, professor at um, University of Tennessee a few years back, he put sensors uh, in a Petri dish, and he was able to measure when uh, bacteria were uh, reproducing because the amount of sound that they produce increases. Now, you can go even deeper than that, and you can go to uh, atom level, where you have in a metal, for example, a lattice of atoms that are vibrating, and they are uh, very well organized, very well um, uh, positioned, but there are little defects in that crystalline lattice. Those defects are called dislocations. And when that material is uh, subjected to stress, for example, some of that dislocations, those defects, might start moving, and that produces sound. Is it ever recordable? Like, can we hear that bacteria are noisy lovemakers? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And you can even hear those little dislocations moving, coalescing and forming a crack, and that's what produces even larger sound that we can hear for inspections or for monitoring bridges or uh, other materials. Okay, so there's teeny tiny sound. That's Absolutely. a scientific term. It is inaudible. It is inaudible to us, right? It is, exactly. Unless we record it and turn it up to 11. E exactly, that's, that's the key. It's inaudible to us. Because we are tuned to listen to certain frequencies, we are tuned to uh, listen to what we call audible sound sounds that are very high frequency, 20 kilohertz or more, we can hear it. But some, uh, some other living beings can, can, can hear it. Now, it's very interesting because these monsters in the movie, I'm pretty sure they are pretty deaf because they seems that they can hear audible sounds. You know, a baby crying, right. people talking, little toys going off, right? But, you know, even if we don't say a word, we're still producing sound. And they don't hear that. And they don't they hear think, that. Thank God. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so you've, you've just clarified, without exception, every 
single motion produces a sound, Absolutely. even if it's inaudible. Turning it around, can there be sound without motion? No, I, I don't think it can because motion typically produces uh, mechanical waves. And if we think about it, that's what sounds is, is mechanical waves propagating through matter, propagating through, through uh, air, through liquids in water, like water, through uh, uh, metals like steel. So no, I don't think so. I don't think there can be sound without matter. All right, Valerie, my name is Faith. I love to quote the Bible. In the Bible, in Joshua, in chapter six, uh, verses one through 27, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and his soldiers stomped their feet and blew their trumpets and the walls came tumbling down. Can sound destroy actual physical things? Oh yes, absolutely. We do it every day. Um, in medical applications, we use ultrasound to break down tumors. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, uh, in another... Uh, Wait, so in that case, what does ultrasound mean when it's applied to sound? It, it means a very high frequency sound. Ultrasound. Sound that is in the uh, range of kilohertz or even megahertz, millions of vibration per second. Just so I understand, um, when we talk hertz, you, when I hear you speak, where are we with hertz? We are probably in the five kilohertz, five to 10 kilohertz. Okay. You know, um, another, another example, it's, it's very well known. You have an opera singer that hits a very, very high uh, note and it can break uh, a, a, a glass, right? That's a right. Crystal, crystal glass. Everyone says mazel tov. that's, that's right. Absolutely, we are creating physical waves right now when I talk. What happens is the, the sound that goes from my mouth to your ears travels as a wave propagating to the air through the air between us. Could we possibly see that in some way? Is there a scientific way of seeing your sound waves coming towards me? Is there? Yes, we could do it. Wow. Absolutely. Can we do we it today do. in the studio? Well, uh, <laughs> what would we need? They are probably looking at that sound uh, as an electrical signal coming from your microphone. Yeah. from my microphone it. and they can see the vibrations and they can even do an analysis and tell us at which, freq at which frequency are we talking at this moment. So sound, sound can um, create physical, can break glass, can, can uh, stun predators. Can it move things? Yes, absolutely. This, things. Every answer is yes, sound is, well, think, sound is amazing. Okay. Think, think about this, sound in the end, if you think about it, is is the propagation of energy through a certain medium, right? Yeah. So you can use that energy to move things. Obviously, in order to move a physical object, the sound has to be probably very low frequency. It will be a very, very, very low pitch and probably with very high amplitude, very high energy. In loud order, and low. Loud and low in order to move this physical object. So when I gave birth without an epidural, I uh, sounded like like a gorilla in the jungle. Like I never knew I could be that loud and low when I was groaning. And <laughs> I, now I understand what pushed that baby out. This makes yeah. sense. Um, there is a subset of superheroes that have power over sound. On Ben 10, the alien Echo Echo from the planet Sunarosia is a living sentient sound wave. Ulysses Claw from Black Panther is a human physicist who has been transformed into solid sound and needs Wakanda's vibranium to turn sound waves into physical mass. Valerie, okay, solid sound and, and physical mass. Does, does sound have mass? It's an interesting way to see it. I think, I wouldn't say that sound has mass. What I would say is actually sound is the movement of mass. Again, as we're talking, the mass of the air that is between us is actually vibrating and moving. If I have a piece of metal, that, do you remember the Lone Ranger uh, when uh, Tonto goes down on the railroad tracks and, and he's listening and says, oh, railroad track coming. Yeah. You know, that is the sound that is being produced by that train traveling along, along the rail to his, uh, to his ears. So, so, you're, so you're saying the sound 
you're, I think you're saying sound doesn't have mass, but it needs mass it, to make sound? It is. Sound, it is the movement of mass. The movement of, of mass. mass. Is that the same thing as saying sound needs mass? Yes. To make sound? Yes. So what about all those movie space battles where we, where we hear, you know, we have movie space sound effects? Are those space sounds even possible if there's not something in space, mass? I love those movies. I love the sounds, but they are not real. They are not real. All these beautiful battles between uh, starships and, uh, and lasers flying and everything, uh, no. Because? Because in the space, there is no mass. It's empty. So there is nothing no air, that transmits nothing. that. If, if you think about movies, there are two movies that are very realistic in that sense. Um, Space Odyssey, uh, 2001, when there are scenes where, uh, you know, people are moving through space, space walking and things like that, there is no sound right. at all. The other one is gravity. Right. Yeah. When uh, the astronauts are talking, they are talk you can hear the sound when they are talking from inside the spacecraft or from the inside of their suits. But when they are moving, even when the asteroids come and hit the space uh, shuttle and the satellite and, and everything, there is no sound. And that's really how it is. You can hear them talking because inside their spacesuit they have oxygen. They which, have air, yes. But if an asteroid hit them, there, ha there would have to be sound because it's something hitting mass. Yes, but in order to hear that, you will have to be either in a spacesuit and receive the vibration or being inside the spacecraft. If you're outside looking out uh, and you see the asteroid hitting the spacecraft, you'll see all the destruction, but you won't hear a sound. That's so crazy. It is. Oh, I mean, to me, maybe not to you. This all makes <laughs> sense to you. The underlying notion of a quiet place is how terrifying would it be if, if we couldn't make a sound, right? An audible sound. But there's something so terrifying about thinking of a world where you can't hear sounds that are being made, like space. Uh, absolutely. It's a handicap, but it's nature. Wow. All right, so, so light is made up of photons, and, and a sound particle is made up of what? Is it, is it atoms? Is it um, molecules? Is it magic? There, there is an equivalence, actually. Um, and. Um, it is called a phonon. And a phonon is defined as a unit of vibration at the atomic level. And it's used in modeling how sound at that level is created and how it can coalesce, phonons can coalesce and eventually can be described as a wave in the macroscopic world, which is where we live. In the DC universe, Cisco Ramon, played by Carlos Valdez on The Flash, is called Vibe and has the power to read and create vibrations. In the Marvel universe, on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., superhero Quake is known as Daisy Johnson and played by the lovely Chloe Bennett. Daisy Johnson also has power of vibrations. She can cause earthquakes. She can hurl someone across the room by sending massive vibrations their way. All right, now Valerie, some, but not everyone in the Marvel and DC fandom world, um, they count Cisco Ramon and Daisy Johnson as heroes with sound-based powers. Can you settle this for us? Are, are vibrations sounds? Yes, they are, absolutely. Are they completely interchangeable? Yes. A vibration can. is a sound, sound, a sound um, is a vibration. It's a vibration, yes. Okay. Now, you have to be careful there because if we're talking about audible sound, you know, the vibrations are low frequency. They are vibrations in, in the matter. But if you look at sound traveling through metals, typically they are at very higher frequency, very high frequency. Again, as I mentioned before, in the order of uh, kilohertz or even megahertz. So humans generally hear, well, humans hear low vibrations. We don't hear past a threshold. Of, we don't have great hearing, right? Compared to compared to the dolphins, kingdoms. compared to even dogs. Yeah, absolutely, we don't. Our ears, 
filter the sound from very, very low frequencies or very, very high frequencies. And that's what we call the audible sound range. Even if we can't detect it, is everything vibrating? Yes, it is. Okay, which makes sense because you told me everything's making sound all the time. Exactly. If you're alive, you're making, if anything's alive, it's making sound. Yes, and even, uh, even inanimated objects make sounds. You have the vibrations of, uh, of the crystal lattices, the atoms vibrating in the crystal, la uh, crystal lattice. Unless you go down to the absolute zero, you know, which is around 273 uh, degrees Celsius or 457 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when even the vibration of those atomic lattices stop. Then you could tell that is absolute silence. So <laughs> here's a dumb question, but that's why I'm here. <laughs> An ice cube is making sound? Yes. That's not absolute zero, right? No, it's, it's just not. Frozen. It's, it's low frequency. An but... ice cube is making sound. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Is, here's a weird one, is a dead person making sound? Probably a dead person might be decomposing, if you think oh about it. Oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> and they the, say that your hair continues to grow. Like after ah, you there you go. Then for sure you're making noise even after you're dead. We've, we've talked a lot about the destructive elements of sound. It can break glass, it can push somebody over. Um, but in your work, you use sound as a diagnostic device, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, we use it pretty much. I, I, I like your uh, analogy when we talk about the medical field, when the doctor comes and listens uh, to your lungs, to your heart. And I even think about, you hear your friend talk and you say, oh, you have a cold. You know, you yes. can, yeah. Yes, exactly. So even by looking, uh, you know, by, by uh, applying these same principles to, um, uh, to metals, to uh, materials, to structures, uh, we listen to the sound uh, patterns. Uh, think, about, think about the Manhattan Bridge or the George Washington Bridge here in New York. Those cables, those suspension cables that support the bridge, they are made out of 20,000 plus wires, single steel wires. We can put sensors on those bridges and listen when a single of those wires break and we can actually tell when it broke and we can count how where many they or bring. when? Where. 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 And we can tell when because our sensors are measuring in time. So we can, we can tell you what is the problem. Or if you have, uh, for example, um, uh, a large storage tank in a refinery um, where you uh, storage uh, either gasoline or crude oil or any other chemical, and uh, you can, we can listen to the sound of the corrosion of the uh, bottom of the tank happening, and we can actually pinpoint where that is coming from and whether, whether it's leaking or not. So we use sound to diagnose the state uh, of an asset in a refinery or a bridge. You're basically the Marvel superhero Karnak. It's not that you have magical abilities, although it sounds magical to me, but you can, you can see the flaw in every design or hear the flaw in every design. Exactly. I like to say that noise are us. <laughs> noise are us. That's good. I think, isn't Toys R Us actually going out of business? So uh, yeah. I think you guys can, can own this. this Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the benefit of diagnosing with sound is that you can understand what's wrong without having to take something completely apart. And that is what we call non-destructive evaluation because, as you said, we don't need to take it apart. And moreover, we can do it while it is uh, doing its function. Non-destructive evaluation. Yes. So is your work essentially all pattern recognition? It is. In the end, that's what it boils down to because you collect all this sound data and you have to find patterns, the patterns that are normal according to the operation of that asset, and then look when you have deviations from that. Is there, so we've talked about, I mean, the, the great analogy um, is how this is used in medicine. You're using it in structures. Is there another application of this that I'm not thinking of? Like, 
this is such a powerful tool. Where, where else can sound evaluation be applied? Like what's the future of what you do? Well, uh, sound evaluation, evaluation, you can use it even in, um, in geophysics, for example, because earthquake moves of uh, earth or uh, minerals or uh, monitoring mines, all those things produce sounds. And that's happening now, right? And that is happening. Is that is that what sonar is? What is sonar? Sonar is using sound to probe, uh, you know, for different things. Okay. You know, I, in, I was about to say in outer space, but not it, in it outer won't work in outer space. No, it won't work in outer space. But it works uh, in the air. It works underwater. It works uh, in, uh, in, on the ground. So it works in a lot of places. Not in space, though. Is your is part of your daily job? I know you travel a lot to yes. places where where your company where Mistras applies the sound evaluation. Yes. I just kind of picture you with a hard hat and headphones on. Are you are you personally in what you do listening a lot? Uh, I used to. I used to when I was um, doing more research uh, okay. for the company. Uh, but now what I do is I travel and I talk to the people who are interested in using these technologies for new applications. So I'm more in charge of um, other areas where we can use our technology, uh, but we have plenty of people, thousands of uh, technicians that de do exactly that. They go and listen every day to different assets all over the world to make sure that they are in good shape. You know, all of this makes me think of the late John Cage. Um, he was an experimental musician, best known for his work, Four Minutes, 30 Seconds, which is a performance by a musician that features the absence of deliberate sound. And most people think this work is about silence. But John Cage was pretty clear that it was about the symphony of sound that simply exists on Earth. With that symphony of sound on Earth, how do you isolate a specific sound? Well, you can isolate it in three different ways. You can isolate it by amplitude, you know, saying if the sound is below a certain uh, loudness level, okay. yeah, you can isolate what we call background noise, or you can isolate it in terms of frequency and that's what we do every day when we go an instrument, an asset. The first thing we do is we look for the background noise, the noise that doesn't have anything to do with what the asset does. Okay. And you can eliminate that. And we can eliminate that. And but wait, we, explain to me, please, the difference yeah. between amplitude and frequency. Amplitude is the loudness. If I talk very, very loud, it's a very low amplitude. If I Fortissimo. Pian pianissimo. pianissimo. Got it. Okay. Exactly. That's amplitude. Now, frequency is the pitch. Remember, if I talk like this, it's a very low pitch. It's Got a it. low frequency. If I talk this high. And I wish then... you would continue to do that just for kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. And if, if, if we talk a uh, high pitch, it's a high frequency. Okay. So those are the ways you can actually separate noise. Now, there is another one. What uh, musicians do is the uh, musicians use uh, directionality. You know, they can use microphones that only look at this area here versus that area there. So if sound comes from this side, this uh, microphone that is pointing on that direction wouldn't, wouldn't hear it. Yeah. So those are the different ways we can, uh, we can isolate sounds depending on what we choose to do with. Because of what you do for a living, do you think that just going through your daily life, you're more mindful of, of sounds? Absolutely. I'm, I'm listening to sounds all the time, you know. I listen to my daughter singing all the time. That's, that's a great thing to have, you know. Uh, I, um, I talk to, uh, to my friends at work. One of them is a specialist in ultrasound, uh, and he is a band player. He has uh, his own band. Uh, I talk to people in other companies that are, are developing new, uh, new sensors that um, look at uh, different frequencies. And this guy has a background in music. Yeah, do you? Do you have a background in music? I don't, music? unfortunately. But as I told you, I'm surrounded by people yes. who uh, produce music. Yes. Music to my ears. That's right. And, 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 uh, and 
if you have the, uh, the right perspective, everything is a kind of music, right? All the time. It's funny, um, we, as you know, it's, it's, it, today happens to be a very rainy day, and I was taking my kid to school in a taxi, and he said, Mom, this, the rain was very loud on the windows. And he said, it sounds kind of like white noise, because he's a city kid, we turn on the white noise mach machine so he can sleep. He said, and it's peaceful, but it's stressful because I can't turn the volume down. down. Exactly. And it was funny to think, you know, you can, it, when you are attuned to all the sounds around you, there's so many ways it can inform you and affect you. And, and absolutely, you can tell um, whether you're in a city, whether you're in a countryside, whether it's raining, whether the wind is blowing, just by listening to this. Yeah. Um, for, for a while, um, my family and I moved down uh, to Houston which is a much quieter city than New York. And my daughter sometimes uh, came to me and said, Dad, this is very quiet compared to New York. And I said, absolutely. Everything's very quiet compared <laughs> to New York. <laughs> Valerie, it was a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you so much for coming by. Uh, thank you very much for having me, and the pleasure is mine.